Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to United Presbyterian Church on this uh, beautiful day. It was good to be back, uh, all rested up from vacation. Uh, just, now I wish I had a pool in my backyard. <laughs> um, a couple announcements uh, this morning. Uh, we had a wonderful turnout for our first movies with purpose. Uh, we watched Aquila and the Bee last Tuesday evening. This Tuesday, we will be watching a film and discussing a film that should be very well known to all of you here, and that's Breaking Away. Uh, and if you have not seen it, I do invite you all out, because it's a wonderful film, and um, it is the perfect David and Goliath story uh, of uh, some local uh, young men who are going up against some pretty tough competition. But it's a wonderful story. Um, you'll laugh, you'll cheer. Um, every time I watch it, I find myself cheering from the couch, even though I know who's going to win. <laughs> it's a wonderful film. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll see a lot of things that are familiar to you as well. Um, so no studies on Tuesday. The evening study, of course, is being replaced by uh, the movie. Our pastor's class is still going on, 8.45 a.m. Uh, we're uh, reformed the theology. And I think that's all you know. Oh, and I will be here next week. Uh, we had a change of plan, so um, I will be in the pulpit next week. Now, we do have an announcement before, Alan. I, I, I think, Edie, you said you have an announcement to make about the shelter? Uh, I'm going to announce that next Sunday. Next Sunday. Uh, Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Alan? The uh, IU Office of International Development sent us a letter and a request. Um, they're seeking host families. You can find it, read all about it. Uh, and just insert in the bulletin. And Don, you want to uh, update us on the backpack program? Yes, I see uh, there have been some additions to the uh, boxes that are out there, but uh, the month is uh, winding down. We've got, I think, two more Sundays, so uh, please don't forget to uh, pick up a few extra things when you're shopping and put them in the collection boxes, one out here and one downstairs. Thank you, Don. Any other announcements to be made?
2018 marks the 185th anniversary of United Presbyterian Church. In 1869, the New Side Covenanters, us, at the urging of Pastor Wiley, were absorbed into the Bloomington United Presbyterian Church that had formed six years earlier with the merging of the Associate and Associate Reformed Churches. Their wood frame church at Ninthon College was dismantled and replaced with a larger <coughs> brick church that could accommodate the three congregations that had joined together to become one with a combined membership of 212. Reverend, Re Reverend William P. <coughs> McNary was pastor when the new church was dedicated in November of 1871. Reverend McNary was a staunch abolitionist as were most members of the congregation. <clears throat> he acted on his anti-slavery beliefs by enlisting in the Union Army at the very start of the Civil War. He served honorably for the duration, participating in nine battles and achieving the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. <clears throat> First Presbyterian Church, 221 East 6th Street, was the first church in Bloomington, according to a detailed history put together by IU journalism professor Owen Johnson. It was founded in 1819 by nine people. First Church was one of 16 churches founded in Indiana by Presbyterian pioneers between 1806 and 1820. It was from the Presbyterian USA denomination, apart from the churches that made up United Presbyterian Church of North America. First Presbyterian, uh, First Presbyterian's uh, present building with a 1,000 capacity sanctuary was built at a cost of $27,094.34 and dedicated in 1901. $27,094.34. <laughs> Have times changed? By 1967, membership was 861. Mergers at the national level have led to First Presbyterian and our United Presbyterian Church finally being in the same denomination. First step was in 1958. United Presbyterian Church of North America merged with Presbyterian USA to form United Presbyterian Church in the USA, including both First and United Presbyterian. The official denominational name became the present Presbyterian Church USA or PCUSA after another national level merger in 1983 brought in the Southern denomination which had broken away during the Civil War. Again, we see how constant communication, questioning, compassion, and compromise was as integral to the congregations that became UPC as was social justice, a welcoming spirit, and focusing on Christ. Even more next week on the amazing, stunning, true story of United Presbyterian. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Accept our offering of praise, O oh God. God's word is a lamp to our feet and light to our path. Accept our offering of praise. O oh God, God, give us life according to your word. word. Your word is the joy of our hearts. God hears us and holds us in this time of worship. Please rise if you are able for opening hymn number 161 as morning dawns.
of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with you. you. Let us share that peace with one another. Peace be with you. 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 Welcome. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's message. <coughs> and before we begin, I thought it would um, be good to have a prayer. Uh, Sahel just took Judy Iris into the hospital. I think she wasn't feeling very well. So why don't we just take a brief moment to say a quick prayer for you with power. Heavenly Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we come to you, we lift up our hearts in prayer for Judy. And we're thankful that Suhail is able to take her to the hospital. We just ask that she gets the care she needs and that they figure out uh, what is going on. Be with her throughout this time. In Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, so today church, we're going to talk about a story when Jesus went home to Nazareth, his hometown. So he was speaking in his synagogue, a lot like how I speak here from the pulpit, and how do you think the people took what he said? Yeah, badly. Why do you think they took it badly? Yes, they don't understand him. That's true. What else do you think they might be thinking? Here's this son of a carpenter preaching to us. And they were thinking, wait a second now. Isn't this the guy whose brothers and sisters we know? We know Mary. We knew Joseph. He played with my kid. And yet he's telling us how we are supposed to be. And so Jesus had a really hard time. And so when we think of this story, we often think of the statement, there's no honor for a prophet in their hometown. But Jesus was trying to preach the gospel of love and compassion, trying to allow them to see all of the wonderful things that he had to share with them. You know, it's really hard when you grow up in a place and then when you go back when you're a little bit older because sometimes those people will see you like you were when you were little. It's kind of like when I go back for my family reunions. And you know what my family calls me? They call me Little John. 
and there's not so much left to call me little about anything. <laughs> but they call me Little John, and my uncles and my aunts and even my cousins, because I was called Little John when I was really Little John. And so it's easy to understand. Even when I talk or give my opinion about something, I still feel my uncles and aunts looking at me like, oh, he's just little John. Even though I'm almost 45 years old. So when we speak or have something important to say, we must think of the time when Jesus went back to his village and they gave him a hard time. So we can do it but it does take a lot of work. It takes a lot of love and compassion. And sometimes people will come around, as lots of people did in Galilee, which is the outer region of where Nazareth sat. So when we think about Jesus' time when he had his homecoming, let us not be discouraged, because hometown prophets can work, but it takes a lot of work, a lot of love, and a lot of compassion, and sometimes a lot of patience. Heavenly Lord, we are thankful that you are a God who teaches us so much. We thank you for the compassion and love that we, that we are able to receive through Christ. Allow us to seek that patience out, especially when we try to minister or Try to live out our lives in areas that are familiar to us and to our friends and family. Allow our, what we have to share to be important, but to do it through love and patience. In Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Our song this morning is number 11, As the Deer.
breathe your loving spirit into us and lead us in the path of truth. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but members together of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Christ himself is our peace. In his flesh, he has made us into one. Amen. Amen. Our first gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, found in the Pew Bible on page 768 and in the large print Bible on page 1549. <coughs> Jesus, <coughs> excuse me. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he does even miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house, is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. This is the word of the Lord. We pick up in verse 6, B through 13, same chapter. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that the people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Apologize ahead of time. I've got like a frog in my throat. I cannot shake. Looking back on my life, I could honestly say that uh, I have made a lot of friends. From grade school to grad school and all points after, my Facebook is full of faces and stories. They're all important as they have all helped shape my journey. But it's those friendships that I made that what I would consider the my hometown, growing up, that they remain in a class by themselves. Perhaps because those relationships were forged so long ago, it almost seems like it's another lifetime. Like a story within themselves. Those from my hometown watched me learn lessons. They saw me succeed and they saw me fail. We all grew together. And back then I did know all my neighbors in the village of Great Kills in Staten Island. It had eyes and ears everywhere. And I mean everywhere. Discipline was a phone call away. Those people, friends and neighbors and acquaintances knew me at my most vulnerable. They knew me, they knew my awkwardness as a kid. That is where my story began. And it's always amazing to hear the stories and journeys of these friends of old, how they've changed, how they've stayed the same. Homecomings can bring such wonderful surprises. Thinking about that trip that Jesus made to Nazareth. 
we witness another community experiencing the return of one of their own. One of theirs acting out of character, shocking with news of a new vocation. We are reminded of that expression, can anything good come out of Nazareth? When Jesus came to Nazareth, he was coming to his hometown. And there are no greater critics than those who knew us when we were knee high. Oh, we remember you. But this is no ordinary homecoming, right? There's no jello puddings, right? No barbecue. Jesus came to work. Mark tells us that Jesus taught in the local synagogue and that the people were astounded. What were they saying? Where did this man get all this? And you can, also, you can almost imagine them looking at each other and talking. What wisdom has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? Is this not Mary's boy? The brother of James and Jose and Judas and Simon? I mean, are those not his sisters? His teaching was greeted not with wonder, but with contempt. They took offense to him. Now the commentaries seem to agree that there are two main reasons for this. The first deals with Jesus' social standing. Is this not the <clears throat> carpenter? Not the Pharisee, not the priest, not the scribe. Who is this handyman that he should tell us about the law? He is no better than we are. The second reason is that they knew him. They knew his family. And maybe they knew him well. Maybe Jesus played with their kids. One commentary says this. Sometimes when familiarity should breed a growing respect, it breeds an increasing and easygoing familiarity. Sometimes we are too near people to see their greatness. And this is what happens to Jesus. We are told that Jesus healed only a few people in Nazareth due to their disbelief and probably due to their hostility that Jesus' own people showed him there in Nazareth. We are told that he quickly moves on to another area and this is of course where we see the, the remainder of chapter 6 move as Jesus is sending out the 12, right? To start doing some work. The life of the church, we take on many roles. Sometimes we are on the left side of the fence, and sometimes we are on the other side of the fence, and sometimes we're sitting on the fence, sometimes we're climbing the fence. Sometimes we act the role of Jesus, and sometimes we act the role of the Nazareans. Sometimes in life our peers judge us, and sometimes we act as the peers who are doing the judging. As Christians, there are things that Christ demands of us that society, well, society, frankly, does not quite understand. Because as Christians, we are supposed to act sometimes in ways that it goes counterculture. And this can cause friction. And it can be especially difficult for those who know us best. For those who've known us our whole lives, perhaps. Or at the beginning stages of our lives, perhaps. It is not always an easy path. 
I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you. Uh, I feel like I've shared it a few times, so if it wasn't this congregation, it was my last or one before that, or maybe I did tell you this story. When I first started seminary, I had gone back to Staten Island, and I had a big dinner with all of my friends that I grew up with. And we were at this wonderful Italian restaurant, big, long table, and they had me either the head or the tail. You could never tell. And we were talking and said, well, what are you doing? What are you studying in graduate school? And I said, well, theology. And someone said, oh, you study of rocks. <laughs> and I said, close. I said, close. A little off. Uh, I said, no, uh, theology is you know, the study of God. I said, I'm going to be a minister. And it got really quiet for about two seconds. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop on that table. And then all of a sudden, the whole table bursts out in laughter. <laughs> as if I just dropped the greatest joke known to mankind. <laughs> and I said, they said, no, really? What are you studying in graduate school? And I said, theology. I said, I'm studying to be a minister. And they roared once again. But after the second roar, I think they began to believe. They began to accept what I was telling them. Now, it wasn't because my friends are of my childhood are rude, or, but they know me. They know me from a child. They know me from my days of pea shooters and mischief. <laughs> I, was a, I was a kid like everyone else. <laughs> but they knew me. And they knew me so well that they could not imagine me standing behind one of these. These were my friends that knew me as I grew. They knew me as I made strides. They knew me as I had my small victories, and they knew me when I failed. They know me close. So I understand that. And this is a, a, a microcosm, you know, a, a small look. It has I'm not putting myself on this same scale, but I understand, I understood a little bit better this passage after that moment. After that moment. Because sometimes when you deal with those who know us the best, it is a path that is met with some resistance. Including resistance from family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and childhood friends. So as followers of Christ, we must foster proper atmospheres. We must strive to build our communities where we live to love and to be caring communities. Because this is what is seen from our neighbors. We must not try to create communities where we are the gatekeepers. That's not our job. We don't get to deem who is worthy to enter or not. We are not here to play judge, nor are we here to be served. Jesus taught those lessons very harshly. Right? We must be a loving, active, and welcoming member of the community in which we serve and in which we live. Because it is possible for us to impact our home communities if the love of Christ is our driving force. If we are going out because of compassion, if we are going out because we wish to serve, if we treat our neighbors as a neighbor and not a number, relationships can be forged. Can anything good come from Nazareth? as the people would say in Judea. Can a prophet have honor in his or her own town? It is possible, but it takes a good deal of work. So let us go and let us work. Let us go and let us serve. In so many different ways, we can reach out within our community 
because we are United Presbyterian Church. Not these walls, not this beautiful stained glass, although I love it, but we are the church. We are the church. And so we are called to service. We are called to go outside and to serve. We are called to reach out to the lost. <coughs> Spreading Christ's gospel by our words and by our actions. Being loving. Being gentle. Being kind. Serving at shelters. Serving at food pantries. Helping out serving with international ministries. There's so many ways. It's the only thing that limits us is our own imagination. There are so many things that we can do. But we are prophets within our hometown. It's what we are. We live here. This is our community, our neighborhood. And so is it possible? Yes. But it takes some work. So I say, go and serve. Go and work. Go and love. And go spread Christ's word throughout our community. To God be all the glory, honor, and praise this day and every day. God gives us the ability of communication. We are given the gift of prayer, the ability to come to God with our concerns. And we also have the ability to go to God with our joys, to share. So what lies heavy upon your hearts this morning? What would you like to share with each other and with God? What joys would you like to share with one another and with God this morning? Yes, sir. I have two things. One, Judy did not feel very well. Yeah. And she was actually doing very faint, and Michelle drove her to the emergency room. Okay. But I guess Michelle's driving is a medical worker because Judy is much better now. <laughs> she's right. in the emergency room, but she's much better, which, sure. is, which is good. Okay. And so this one keeps Judy in our minds. Sure. The other thing is that our beloved uh, interim pastor, Mitch Corbin, and Linda, his wife, are moving from. Tennessee to uh, Canada, to Victoria, ah. as we speak. They're, they're driving to Canada, oh. so if we can keep them in our mind, wow. in our prayers. His wife is Linda? Linda, yeah. Mitch and Linda. <coughs> wow. Don't let my wife hear you say that. That's where I want to retire. Uh -oh. <laughs> she likes it nice and warm. I'm ready to go live with the Canadians. I'm ready to go to Yukon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Uriel. What other prayer requests we have this morning? Yes, Pat. Uh, I'd like to have prayer to be able to come to church more. Well, we love having you here. Thank you. Miriam, for your hands. Yeah, my hand, and then I'm going on a trip. Are we from tomorrow, I'm going to Missouri, and the name is Branson. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this will be from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other requests this morning? All right. Let us bow our heads and uh, go to God to pray. Heavenly Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the cloudy skies, and we thank you for the rain that we received yesterday. As life on earth, we need both the sunshine and the rain to sustain life here on earth. Lord, we thank you for so many things. And we just ask that you give us the ability to be prophets within our hometown. It is difficult, especially for when we are so well known by others whether it be friends or family, co-workers, give us the ability to be able to reach. 
but to do it in ways that is caring and loving, not heavy hand. To be able to reach out, to spread love and compassion that people might hear. Give us that gift. Lord, we lift up our world and we ask for prayers for those who live in areas where war is a constant, where people have to flee their homes and become refugees, leaving everything behind them. We lift those people up. We lift up people who struggle because they live under a yoke of apartheid, where they are treated less than a human. We lift those people up. We ask that you give them strength, allow your presence to be felt, allow heroes to rise, to stand up, and to fight injustice. Because as we know, there is no peace without justice. And there is no justice without peace. Lord, we lift up our own nation. And as always, we pray for those people who have been elected to care for us. We pray for our president. We pray for our courts. We pray for those women and men who are elected to create and enforce laws. We ask that those laws be fair and just to all people living within our land. We pray for those who serve overseas, whether within the military or the Peace Corps or your mission field. It is difficult and lonely to be away from family and friends. Well, again, allow your presence to be felt. Lord, we thank you for our community of faith here in Bloomington. We ask you to be with those who are crushed in spirit or depressed, those who struggle with anxiety, those who are healing from a surgery or healing from an illness. We ask, Lord, hear our prayers. And we are comforted because our prayers do not fall upon deaf ears. Whether our prayers are spoken aloud within these walls or whether they are spoken at the side of one's bed in silence, you know what we are about to say even before our lips move. And for that we are grateful and we thank you. So we say, Lord, hear our prayers. We again lift up Judy Iverson as she has been taken to the hospital to be checked out as she has been feeling weak. Lord, we just ask that you work with those doctors there at the ER that are able to figure out you know, what's going on with our Judy, um, that they're able to, uh, to figure out and correct uh, what's going on within her. We just ask that you care for her. Lord, we also lift up Mitch and Linda Coggin as they are in the process currently of moving to Canada. Uh, we thank you for their blessing, especially to here at, at United in Bloomington and uh, wherever their next adventure is to lead them. Be with them as they go. Allow them to arrive safely and to, uh, to be a blessing in their new community. Lord, we lift up Patty and we are thankful that she's here. Um, and that she would like to become more active within church and spend more time here. Uh, we just ask that uh, the avenues be open and that she feels, uh, she feels better to do so. That whenever she wishes to be here, a way is open that she can be here. And Lord, we lift up Miriam. We pray for her hands, uh, for the health of her hands. And we also um, ask for traveling mercies as she prepares to travel to Branson, Missouri that she has a good time away from home, a fun vacation, and that she arrives safely back to us when her trip is over. Lord, we thank you for so many things. We thank you that you are a loving and caring God. We thank you that you inspire us to be more than what we are. We thank you that you inspire us to be the champion of the least of these as you are, that we take up the cause of the widow, the alien, and the orphan that we seek out the most vulnerable within our own society and be their champion as you are their champion. Allow us to be inspired to be more than what we are. Allow us to be inspired to reach out into the margins and help people walk back with their heads high with dignity as you did. 
As you did not see people as unclean, you saw them as people that you loved. Allow us to be that light within our community, now and always. And allow us now to close our prayer with the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have come to the point within our worship service where we are able to give back a portion of which God has so generously given to us. Freely as you have been given, freely give. precious name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we prepare to sing our closing hymn for our worship service this morning. Uh, it's hymn 376, Love Divine, All Love, Accept.
You know, as uh, Alan was giving a brief history of our denomination, uh, I actually served as a summer intern at Columbus, Georgia, uh, the actual church where the General Assembly took place to reunite the denomination. So, uh, yeah, it was really neat. I spent three months at that very historic church. And uh, it only took us over 100 years to reunite after the Civil War. <laughs> What's a few years? <laughs> As we are about to leave the sanctuary and re-enter uh, re our community, let us go and somewhere in our minds understand that we are people. And these neighbors, they know us. They are our friends. They are our family. This is our hometown. And sometimes we are met with resistance from those who know us the best those who see us as the familiar. But it doesn't mean that there is not work to be done. It doesn't mean that we say, oh well, time to go home and watch Netflix. It means we must go out still. It means we must go and serve. It means we must go out and love. It means we must go and find mission because that's what we are called to do. We are called to serve, to love, and to reach out to the lost. That is what we are called to do. And if it's harder within those that we seem more familiar with, then so be it. We're Presbyterians. Let us take the challenge and move forward and serve and love our community. May the love of the Father and the peace of the Son and the communion of the Holy Ghost Go with you on this day and every day, and as always, go in peace.